Hi, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to the uh, Orthopedic Trauma Journal Club through AO North America on distal femur fractures. We'll give a few minutes uh, here to let people log in, then we'll get started pretty quickly so we can cover all the interviews and have time for Q&A at the end. So again, welcome to AO North America's Journal Club on distal femur fractures, and I really want to extend uh, a lot of gratitude to the uh, article authors and guest faculty that we have with us today. Uh, we really sincerely appreciate it. I, along with my moderators, uh, Christopher Lee and Eric Lund, will help moderate the chat room and uh, monitor the questions at the, during the live Q&A session after the conclusion of the interviews. This is a list of our faculty who are joining us tonight and who also have done pre-recorded interviews that you'll be seeing. This is a disclosure slide showing all relevant disclosures for the moderators as well as guest faculty. Just a reminder for etiquette, uh, please pose all your questions in the chat room during which, through which the moderators will help answer either uh, via the text form or out loud during the Q&A session. Your microphones have been muted and your videos turned off for this program. This is a brief agenda for the interview listing. The learning objectives are to, for this program are to recognize the presence of coronal plane fractures associated with distal femur fractures and to help develop a treatment plan, to understand the risk factors and rate of reoperation for lateral locked plate fixation, and utilize this to guide your management as well as counsel the patient. And lastly, to appreciate the existence of multiple alternative fixation constructs to achieve successful treatment, which includes uh, dual plating and or hybrid nail plate combinations and when to use them. So without further ado, we'll get started with our first interview that was done by my co-moderator, uh, Eric Lund with Dr. Swinkowski. And I just wanna give a shout out to Eric Lund and the North Star Trauma Group up in Minneapolis, St. Paul, who are having an event tonight where they're all watching and logged in. Thank you for giving me and the AO your time this morning uh, to discuss your paper. I appreciate it. Um, so I don't know if we just wanna get um, into the uh, kind of context of the late 80s and early 90s for distal femur fractures and to what um, extent your practice was then, what your colleagues were doing and the implants available. Adult femur fractures were still being treated in traction. Um, Acetabular fractures for the most part, except for posterior walls were being treated in traction. Shortly after I arrived, uh, uh, Dan told me that he had hired Roy as, as a fellow from New York. And I never, I'd never met Roy. So uh, we worked together and there was really not a whole lot of essential difference in our experience being both very young. So we did a lot of surgery together and then Roy drifted over to the Nashville General, um, but still still worked a lot at Vanderbilt and Nashville General was way underserved and he, he just did an excellent, outstanding job of fashioning a service over there, um, an orthopedic service. It had been not well staffed uh, previous to that. The faculty learned a dynamic new technique of retrograde flexible nailing for distal femur fractures using Ender's nails. Uh, and then a guy named Zickel from New York had a device that had uh, um, curves on it, a little more substantial than Ender's nails. It also had a, a locking screw. So they were using those devices for distal femur fractures and were at least able to get people out of traction. So in the toolbox for the AO large fragment set, all you, all you have is a, a 95 degree angle blade, which um, I had some experience with uh, and had confidence with, um, but a lot of the fractures uh, the, you know, involved the articular surface to a much greater degree. So that forced us to learn how to use the condylar a buttress plate, which of course is not um, angular stable. There's there's no locking devices, and so the first the first thing we figured out was that you you should uh, when you have the distal block assembled and there's not a whole lot of combinations, what you can do is angle a, a screw through a more proximal plate at about 45 degrees to essentially push against the medial condyle. Uh, and try to control the angle that way. Uh, and you could do that. And we actually subsequently published a biomechanics study out of Harborview to prove that 
It really does that. That will that only works if you've got you know substantial medial block. So uh, we figured we figured you, you've got to do something to, to to maintain the the articular shaft angle. So we started putting medial plates on to do that, and we were we were using either T plates uh, from the large fragment set or we were using um, standard plates because you don't really need too much other than one or two screws in the, in the distal block and one or two in the shaft to control the angle. So, uh, and then Roy uh, convinced uh, his mentor in New York to add cases. Um, so Howard, Howard Rosen was our co-author on it, adding some of his, I don't remember who added what, and it worked pretty well. Uh, we learned pretty quick that um, the dissection on the medial side is important. You kind of have to peel the VMO off the intermuscular septum in order not to denervate it or, or damage it. So we learned that. Uh, and those medial plates bug patients, we learned that um, because they, they're fairly prominent you know, at the adductor tubercle. Uh, so a lot of them had to be removed. Um, lecturing on this earlier in my career, I have the case that inspired it. It's really a failure of a condylar buttress plate going into Vera. And because a lot of these were um, uh, C1 uh, uh, fracture type, you had uh, partially threaded screws. So the interface between the holes in the, the, and the plate and the screws was not rigid at all and could easily move. Um, so that the failure is what's, what, uh, and of course the failure ultimately led to locking plate. I think that was one of the really early uh, areas where the technical commission of the AO, which I had the pleasure of serving on for five years in the early 90s, we recognized this was one where you need to do something. Also struck me about the this case series was the high rate of success. So nine out of nine united. And these were, as you mentioned, high energy trauma patients. There are five open fractures that were four of them were um, grade two and the rest were grade three, yet no non-unions, no infections. You know, our soft tissue technique, because of our training, both Roy's and mine was really pretty good. Uh, so, uh, and the distal femur has a robust blood supply. So unless you really do too aggressive of dissection and the open injury isn't too severe, you're not, very often going to get infection if you have stable fixation and we had we had stable fixation to beat the band with dual plating also feel obligated to point out you know this is a cohort study i can't honestly remember if we had cases that we didn't include in the series um, but anytime you have a cohort series uh, that's a, that's a possibility it's it's you have you have selection bias involved Fair enough. And then speak to the fact of bone grafting and open fractures and acutely bone grafting just a closed distal femur fracture. Uh, back then you were doing that and do you have any use of that now? And could you talk about that? Uh, it was it was uh, kind of the, the, the theory at the time that you needed bone grafting. And I would say it's not very often done any longer. It's something we learned from experience in uh, metaphyseal region it is rarely needed, if if any. Um, one thing that was noted was stiffness and range of motion. Stiffening. Yeah. Even though you guys yeah. basically let it move right away and you use CPM. Yeah, we did. Uh, and it, I think it's because of that medial dissection. Um, you know, it, to elevate the VMO certainly is is not a benign thing, um, and it, you're you're really creating a bunch of scarring on the medial side of the knee. So I, I think that's the reason why they're relatively stiff. Later, remove, I've removed some of the plates and manipulated the knee, and it did increase uh, you know, 20, 30 degrees of flexion. Them is indications for single implant versus dual implant uh, for distal femur fractures and how, how you go about that in your practice. Yeah, well, we, the implants are great now. It's really, really rare that you have to add a medial plate. Um, and that usually has to do with very poor bone quality with a bad fracture pattern. Um, of course, we we have better nails for retrograde nailing too. So that's that's an option for people with shorter metaphyseal 
fragments than we had when we were bending pincher nails. But the, the locking distal femoral plate, single plate, is, is pretty good. If I were to add a plate these days, I would probably consider going to a 3-5 plate, 3-5 implant as a strut, rather than what we were doing, which required much bigger dissection and more scarring. Uh, Dr. Sikowski, thank you for spending your time with us to go over um, your clinical expertise and obviously research expertise on this paper and, and otherwise. And um, the AO and the listeners, thank you for your time. Well, I owe, I owe a lot to AO. Stefan Perrin uh, helped me start my career. And uh, uh, it's been a pleasure to go back in history and think of those times when Roy and I were uh, energetic and uh, arrogant and <laughs> never thinking we were wrong. And now we'll, uh, while we get the second video teed up, this will be an interview with Dr. Roy Sanders, who was a co-author on that paper with Dr. Swinkowski, also discussing that paper. Thank you for tuning in to the AO uh, Monthly Journal Club. I have the uh, pleasure and benefit of interviewing Dr. Roy Sanders down in Tampa, who was my mentor during fellowship year, on a paper from 1991 in the JBJS Journal about double plating comedy unstable distal femur fractures. Dr. Sanders, thank you for spending your time with us tonight. Well, yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. That uh, paper is, uh, what, uh, 30 years? Is that right? Yeah, amazing. I was born just before it. Yeah, amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you've had a lot of research in your experience, but tell me in brief what this paper has meant to you um, and how it's had a resurgence uh, as of late. Uh, well, the paper uh, really was a state of the art at the time, uh, and uh, it was an uncommon fracture, and uh, I uh, used uh, my mentors, uh, Dr. Rosen and Dr. Sinkowski, Dr. Halpin, who was my partner at the time in Tampa, uh, to collate these and look at them and see what the outcome was of uh, these uh, really difficult fractures. You say Mueller et al. recommended the use of this medial plate. Is that where you got the idea? This is from 72. This probably had the double plating. This is unbelievable. So this is Phil. Spiegel's book edition, you see that? And that's, um, who is that? That's um, Hans Villeneger. One is Martin Algauer. And this one is Thomas Rudy. And this one is Stefan Perrin with a picture of uh, the Davos Mountain. There we go. That's it. But there was, never, there was never a series on it, so I reported on it because it was a real problem. I needed everybody's because there was no way to fix them. And this is this is the second edition from '79, when the fracture, when the condyles were shattered, uh, then it would became really complicated. How do you fix it with a blade plate? A blade can't hold anything, right? So then you put on. Uh, all you had uh, was a, uh, it's called a Burry, uh, after uh, Dr. Burry, B-U-R-R-I, uh, and he came out of Ulm, U-L-M, so it was a, called the Ulm plate. Uh, and so you put on this plate, but it didn't have locking screws, right? So it really looks like a condylar plate, but it didn't have any locking screws. So you put this on and the thing was flopping around, so how do you fix it? Uh, you put the medial plate on. Uh, but you, but nobody really wanted to plate medial because in their vascular bundle there, you know, uh, and so uh, these things would fall apart. Very limited implants, so uh, it became a problem. And when I got to Tampa, um, and even when I was in uh, Nashville uh, in '86 and stuff, people wearing seatbelts, they were they were getting really 
trash, but they were alive. And they started having all these high energy dashboard injuries because that's a dashboard injury. And um, uh, there was no way to fix them. But we tried this and it worked. With bone graft, it worked. You have to remember there was no OTA really. Um, and nobody uh, understood fractures. Rockwood and Green did not teach you operative technique. It just taught you about fractures. So there was no YouTube. There was nothing. So the only way you could learn was to go to an AO course, excuse me. And they had written all these books and made all this equipment. So they had a complete method of fracture fixation. And the reason um, that they had these different screwdrivers was because when you when you use a large fragment screwdriver, right, you use your shoulder, your arm, you use there's a lot of torque, yeah. right? But they don't want you to do that with a small fragment screwdriver because you'll strip it. So they changed the handle so you could only do this and only use your forearm muscles. And then when you use a jewelers, you're only using your intrinsics, right? So there's no way that you can, you know, use all that torque. You're brilliant people. But I imagine this was presented at AO courses uh, where you show, because they were very specific, like they just wouldn't let anybody lecture, right? So they gave the junior guys the, the simpler fractures, right? And gave you very basic lectures. And if you didn't lecture well and didn't have good x-rays, you never got asked again to show up for a lecture. I mean, it was really... Awesome. So, uh, and then there's more senior people, right, uh, who had a lot of experience, uh, would would do the big fractures, like Shatsker would always give the tibial plateau fracture lecture, right? Helfit would give the elbow, Helfit or Kellum would do distal femur. So the basic would just give you, you know, trapezoidal distal femur and be careful where the blade goes. When you get to the advanced course, which you, you had to prove that you actually went to the basic course and passed it. When you went to the advanced course, then uh, they showed you these techniques. So these techniques were available. They're in the book. They went over them, but there was never a series of them. You know, somebody would do it once or twice. So, and I actually had to collect cases, uh, which is why um, this paper has so many authors, right? So when I was, and really, I, I, in my residency at joint diseases with Howard Rosen, Howard brought AO to America in 1965. And then, so I was trained by him and he had a wealth of papers, a wealth of cases. And then when I went to um, at Vanderbilt, I was with Swinkowski and Swinkowski had one or two cases from, I think from Nashville that I did with him as a fellow. And I think he had a case or two from Seattle back then. And then when I went to Tampa, I was with Helfit uh, in the beginning, because he recruited me uh, before everything blew up in Tampa. And uh, we had done a bunch of these, and I did a bunch of those. So it was the four of us. And we were all, you know, I was the most guy, but they were all very well respected uh, AO uh, faculty. And so this paper uh, carried a lot of weight because we actually had clinical follow up uh, that could show you that this technique worked in these really bad fractures. We were doing um classic technique you open it uh you anatomically reduce it uh you put all the fragments back together right and then you go ahead and uh plate it and bone graft it and then you hope you win the race and then to your follow-up uh through multiple centers uh is also impressive as well you think it was um easier back then for follow-up or harder because of less communication and technology uh, well, these people, uh, we put the, you know, so you're talking about nine cases, right? So, you know, you put the fear of God in these folks and uh, you just don't let them go and uh, they're worried. And so you just keep watching them. And uh, back then it was uh, actually, I think people were less mobile uh, in terms of moving around the country. Uh, and so uh, they tended to stay put. And if you, you know, like they had a home phone number. Right, so you always could get a hold of them somehow. Now, you, it's really hard to get a hold of people. Um, what would you say now, because there's a lot of uh, other, obviously, distal femur fracture papers have come out of Tampa and from your group, clinical as well as biomechanical. Could you speak to any of those more recent publications you've been involved with in the context of this one and dual plating or nail plate combo? Uh, 
Uh, I, uh, over the years, have become a nailer. Uh, although I, I love to plate, uh, and I was raised and taught to be a plater, um, nails are just so uh, load sharing uh, and uh, uh, allows you to get the patient to walk and to bend uh, their knee in this case so much sooner that um, I uh, would rather do a nail plate combo now. Uh, well, I'd rather do a nail, and if I can't do a nail um, because the fracture is too low and it's a stable fracture, I'll use a plate. But if it's an unstable fracture that's low uh, with medial comminution, uh, metaphyseal comminution, I would definitely use a nail plate combo. And the nail plate combo allows them to walk right away, move their knee right away, um, and that can help the healing. Perfect. Well, thanks, man. I appreciate it. It's good to see you. That was excellent uh, perspective from uh, Dr. Swinkowski and Dr. Sanders, and uh, very exciting. And uh, we appreciate their time. And we'll look forward to hearing our next interview uh, with Dr. Sean Nork on the association between supracollar, intercollar distal femur fractures, and coronal plane fractures. Hi, Dr. Nork, it's good to see you. Um, thanks for agreeing to talk to us about the article that you're first author on between with the association between supercollar, intercollar fractures of the distal femur and coronal plane fractures. Um, nice to see you, Mike. Thanks for, uh, thanks for having me. Likewise. Um, so the first session on what, what this AO Journal Club we're gonna start out with is what prompted you and your partners uh, and co-authors on, uh, on this paper to start this study or to perform this study? Well, I think more than anything, given kind of the year of this study, we just didn't have a great understanding for the fracture patterns that we were seeing. Uh, the fracture patterns that were typically showing up at Harborview hadn't read the textbook uh, and weren't limited to a single uh, intercondylar component with or without comminution. So our initial impetus was really just to gain a better understanding uh, for, for really describing fracture comminution of the distal femur and uh, the common fracture configurations that we were seeing. Also have to remember that at that time, it was where we were transitioning um, to the use of locking implants. Um, locking implants had come out just a few years before. We'd been treating distal femur fractures with angled blade plates or non-locking lateral plates. Uh, so the relationship between coronal plane fractures and the implants themselves, we thought, was becoming increasingly important. So we first wanted to understand the fractures, but then we also wanted to know how common are they and are we missing them? And should we be using different imaging studies? Because at the time that we started this study, when we looked back retrospectively, we were getting CT scans on a minority of these injuries, but as the study progressed, it became much, much more common because we were seeing coronal plane fractures uh, much more frequently than we, than we initially thought, I think, at the start of the study period. Okay. That, that's part of um, when, you know, when we talk about some of the questions are how has it changed your practice? So before this and initially, were these primarily being worked up with just plain x-ray? Was obtaining a CT scan a much bigger deal 20 years ago than it is today in terms of timing and getting the patient in the OR? Um, and what kind of, well, you said you changed kind of how you're looking at these, what other imaging studies were you getting or getting now that you didn't then? Yeah, I think part of it was to almost make getting a CT scan virtually the standard practice for evaluating these, just like we would with a, a tibial plateau or a pilon fracture. And at the start of the study, really a minority of patients were getting CT scans and we had missed coronal plane fractures. And by the end of the study, about three quarters of patients were getting CT scans, uh, but we still don't always see the coronal plane fractures 
on plain film imaging, which is probably less worrisome if it involves the lateral condyle, but I think more worrisome uh, if, if it involves the, the medial side, which we wouldn't routinely see with our usual exposures at that time. Um, and it, did it change anything in terms of your surgical approaches or, you know, with your preoperative planning, what, what things were you doing differently after you found the results of this paper? I think we were much more aware of the existence of medial sided coronal plane fractures, although it was still a minority of patients, it was a, it was a complete disaster if that uh, was missed. I do think it got us thinking about alternative exposures or which exposure uh, would allow us to see the entire uh, joint. Um, and I think it made us more aware of fixation strategies uh, and the conflict that we would frequently see with placement of implants to stabilize coronal plane fractures and how would that interact with, uh, with lateral fixed angled constructs. Although that wasn't the, the motivation of the paper or the point of the paper, I do think it started to generate uh, all of those thoughts and concerns and how to manage those as we moved, moved forward on treating complex distal femur fractures. Can you kind of talk about that reconciliation of implants that you, that you went through in terms of what was the iteration of how you started fixing them and then where you are now with terms of that? Yeah, so when we first started fixing these, we were using much larger implants to stabilize coronal plane fractures because they were displaced articular injuries, and that was more our habit. And then we were realizing to try and get a lateral implant in place, a lateral plating construct that would span the metaphyseal area, uh, these larger implants to stabilize the coronal fractures were taking up a lot of that valuable real estate. So I think with time, we started to use smaller and smaller implants to stabilize coronal plane fractures to allow room for implants on the lateral side or in the future, even on the medial side, uh, so that we could get adequate fixation into the articular block. So once again, it wasn't the, the point of the manuscript, but I think it started to generate uh, a lot of thoughts with regards to how we could optimally treat these, prioritizing the joint, but still allowing ourselves the ability to put on a lateral uh, implant to stabilize both the articular block uh, and the diaphysis. Yeah. Um... In terms of when you look at this manuscript, or was there things at the time that you felt, or what, what do you feel were the limitations of how this manuscript was developed or this paper? I think probably the biggest limitation is I don't know that our patient population is representative of distal femur fractures that one might see at a hospital where the, the energy of the injury is not quite as great. But I think that's okay because I think what we demonstrated was a high incidence of associated coronal plane fractures. And I think encouraging surgeons to really evaluate these with CT scans and be aware of them um, is extremely valuable. And I'd rather them be looking for these injuries in a very large percentage of patients, almost 40% of patients in our series, uh, even if they only occur in 20 or 25% of the fractures that they're seeing. But I don't think that our uh, patient population is really representative of what someone might see at either a community hospital or a level two center where there are fewer open injuries or lower energy supracondylar or intercondylar fractures. Okay. Um, if you were given the chance and you could repeat this type of study, would you? And if so, would, what would you change about it? Yeah, so I don't think it probably needs to be repeated now because I think so many of the conclusions of it are, are routine and, and well-known in 2021. Of course, we should get a CT scan uh, for these. And of course, they're more common in open injuries. And we do see 
uh, coronal plane fractures of both the medial and lateral side. And the lateral coronal plane fractures are more common. I think, I think it, the study itself doesn't need to be redone, but I would like to have maybe expanded on how to use that knowledge uh, to come up with strategies for fixation which surgical approaches are optimal with which patterns can you combine surgical approaches about the knee and distal femur fractures for really complex injuries uh, should you start with a parapetellar approach and use use increased knee flexion uh, to assess the joint intraoperatively uh, depending upon the complexity so i would have loved to have expanded on uh, the surgical techniques for fixation, but the point of the original manuscript is really just to describe the association, recommend CT scans, and increase awareness of the fracture patterns that we see. I know that in some of the other articular injuries like um, distal tibia, plafond extension with distal shafts, like where HSS has looked at the use of MRI, like it's just, do you think this is an injury where addition of an MRI study would be of any use or utility, you know, looking at these types of injuries if they're missed on both CT scan and plane film? I would give it a perhaps at best, but with no data to back that up. We're just not seeing significant instability after supracondylar, intercondylar distal femoral fractures, whether or not they have associated coronal plane fractures in comminution. And I think with heightened awareness and scrutiny of CT scans, I just don't see where we're missing these injuries, especially now that it's almost routine to even get 3D reconstructions of CT scans so that we don't have to try and generate uh, an understanding uh, of these fracture patterns in our, in our mind. I think that's probably so made. Exactly. I think it's made it's made an understanding of these uh, a lot easier as well. So I think with that as an addition to standard uh, CT scans, I, I think we have a pretty good understanding for both the morphology of the fracture, and then that will generate uh, an intelligent fixation construct. Awesome. Um, I guess my my final thought uh, question to you would be: When you think of distal femur fractures, is there a paper or um, surgeon that you think of that impacted what you do or how you thought of these? Well, I think my approach to these, like with all periarticular fractures, is was always influenced by my senior partners. Uh, so Dr. Steve Benershka and Brad Henley, who were both co-authors on the manuscript, I think really taught me and all of my co-surgeon colleagues and friends uh, to have a real appreciation for the complexity of these of these fracture patterns. And so I think conversations uh, with them really motivated me to try and understand these these distal femur fractures uh, in more detail for sure. Awesome. Well thank you so much Sean. I really appreciate your time. Yeah uh, thank you Dr. Tallarico. Uh, hope to see you soon. So now, as Dr. Nork alluded to, the uh, changing of implants around the early 2000s uh, with the advent of the lateral locked plate, we're going to move on to Dr. Uh, Ritchie's recorded interview concerning his OTA highlight paper um, for risk factors of the failure of locked plate fixation of distal femur fractures. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Ritchie, to talk about your OTA highlight paper, Risk Factors for Failure of Locked Plate Fixation and Distal Femur Fractures, an analysis of 335 cases. Can you start off by talking about what was going on at the time with distal femur fracture fixation that prompted this study? Yeah, sure. Uh, again, thanks for uh, choosing this article. Uh, at that point in time, you know, locked plating was relatively mainstream, and 
it was used, I wouldn't say exclusively, but uh, nearly exclusively for the treatment of distal femur fractures. And it sort of supplanted non-locked fixation and was uh, sort of transitioning to supplant fixed angle fixation like blade plates and uh, DCS devices. Uh, assuming you're going to plate, if you're going to nail it, it's a whole different conversation. So lock plating was becoming more and more popular, was popular, and uh, there was some evidence in the literature that there was modest non-union rate with lock plating of distal femur fractures. And so what prompted the study was we wanted to see like what factors were associated with healing complications when using lock plates to fix these fractures. And can you summarize some of the main points and findings from your article? Yeah, so uh, we found that uh, some of the factors were uh, completely out of surgeon control and some were uh, within surgeon control. That's one of, one of the goals of the papers. You know, there's certain things we as surgeons can control and should and can modulate and others we really can't. So we found that not surprisingly that there were some patient factors that uh, uh, contributed to risk of healing complication, namely uh, open fracture, we have no control over that, diabetes status and uh, patient weight, heavier, bigger patients, a little higher non-union or non-union rate, open fractures and patients with diabetes. And then you know, the one factor that was uh, within surgeon control was the length of proximal fixation. And I think at this time period, this was when uh, the length of plates uh, that we used was relatively variable. And I think today, most, pace, most surgeons are using relatively long plates, and, and what is that? And we, we'll, we'll talk about that. You know, what is long enough? Uh, but some at that period of time were using relatively shorter plates. And so what we found was, uh, you know, it's a little hard to normalize in millimeters, but you know, by hole length, uh, eight holes or longer was associated with less risk of. of uh, fixation failure than shorter plates. I read in your paper that for open fractures, the average metaphysy will avoid was seven centimeters. How do you decide how much to debride for those open fractures and has that changed over the years? Yeah, that's a really good question. That was the subject of actually a follow-up study um, that we did with Corey Collins was one of the uh, co-authors and what in, in discussing this issue with Corey, it became uh, apparent that his sort of protocol was to do sort of minimal debridement of bone. And our protocol at the time was to be more aggressive. And so we looked at that. And so what's the optimal amount of debridement that should be done? Still, again, up for uh, debate. Uh, the more debridement you do, in theory, less devitalized bone, less chance of infection. Uh, the, but the, the more debris might you do, the bigger the defect, the harder it is, the more procedures it's going to take to, uh, to get this individual to heal. Mm -hmm. And so what I took away from that is, you know, if it, this is a contaminated wound and there's contaminated, clearly devitalized bone, well, that's got to go in the bucket. But if this is a relatively clean wound and you have marginally viable fragments, I, I err now towards leaving those in that situation. But this is, this is a little bit of the art of surgery. You know, in your manuscript, you had mentioned uh, titanium and steel. Have you found that to you know, be important in these fixation constructs? Yeah, that's a, you know, something that's the subject of a lot of different papers and a lot of controversy and a lot of conflicting results. And if you look critically at this literature, and, and this is sort of a whole other point to be discussed, is uh, you know whether you're using stainless steel or titanium has an impact on the stiffness of the construct. And locked screws versus non-locked screws and the quality of the bone also has to do with the stiffness. And, and if you don't mind, we'd like to come back to that. 
But what, what all of these papers, almost all, fail to do when they analyze this is to look at the construct. In, was the construct designed to compress a simple fracture and was that construct designed to induce primary bone healing? In which case, the stiffness characteristics of your construct are different than if the construct, this was a comminuted fracture that you, you spanned and you did a bridge plating technique and your construct was designed to induce secondary bone healing. Then the stiffness parameters of that in an ideal situation are different. That parlays into the, you know, should you use locking screws or non-locking screws in the shaft? And actually we have a, a manuscript that's just being uh, submitted that shows that whether, if you have good quality bone in the shaft of the femur, it makes absolutely no difference whether you use locked or non-locked screws to the stiffness of that construct. And that actually is contrary to popular belief, but it really does make some sense. If you've got good quality bone, you've got good fixation of your non-locked screw, and you have, if you use locked screws, you'd have good fixation with your locked screws. In either one of those situations, there's gonna be essentially no motion between plate and bone in the shaft. And so the stiffness that your fracture sees or the strain that your fracture sees is dictated by the working distance and the material. And whether these screws are locked or non-locked in the shaft really makes no difference whatsoever. That situation is different if you're talking about osteoporotic bone. In osteoporotic bone, when you put purely non-locked screws compared to purely locked screws, there's a difference. There's not really much of a difference at time zero because both will have good fixation, but over cyclic loading, non-locked screws and osteoporotic bone tend to loosen. And so the construct starts to fail, but the bottom line is an osteoporotic bone Non-lock constructs are less stiff than lock. I would agree with that after cyclic loading. But in good quality bone, it really doesn't make any difference. How did the results of this study sort of change your practice? So uh, it, it emphasized the need for longer plates, uh, you know, at least eight holes spanning the proximal fragment. And again, I, I think some of the offshoot studies from this have changed my debridement protocols a little less aggressive for the clean open fracture. I think that was uh, important. Uh, I think those are the two main things that came away from this. And then it, it prompted the biomechanical study that I mentioned, the locked versus non-locked, um, to give us a little bit more clarity on that. Uh, and I, I think it just prognosticates that, you know, the diabetics and the obese and the the open fractures are just bad actors. And, and you know, that's the group that we probably uh, should definitely think about adjuncts of some sort, whether it's a medial plate, whether it's a nail plate construct, whether it's some biologic bone, you know, acute bone grafting. Um, so I think that was another take home. I, I, I have uh, acutely bone grafted some of these uh, you know, more severe fractures a little bit more after this study than before. Again, it, it's a known diabetic, uh, you know, relatively obese patient. I don't acutely bone graft open fractures, but if it's a closed fracture and a high risk patient, it's something to consider. Awesome. Well, I really appreciate you taking time to discuss your great article with us. Yeah, appreciate it. And uh, thanks very much. Uh, and of course, thanks to uh, the co authors. I mentioned Corey Collins. Uh, and the guys in Seattle that contributed a lot of cases, we had 300 and some odd cases. So it was a big study that took a lot of effort from uh, three different institutions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ritchie, and we'll be moving on as he and other authors have alluded to the discussion of not only a dual plate construct, but also a hybrid construct, including uh, plate 
uh, nail plate combination techniques, which uh, we have been joined by Dr. Liberace and Dr. Yoon, who will be discussing their pre-recorded interview and then the question interview session. So we'll pull up that video. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Liberace and Dr. Yoon, to talk about your um, technical trick manuscript, nail plate combination technique for native and periprosthetic distal femur fractures. Can you start off by talking about what was going on at the time with distal femur fracture fixation that prompted this study and how this nail plate combination sort of evolved? Sure. Um, probably about maybe 12 years ago or so, um, you know, we were, many of us were starting to notice that distal femur fractures, even when you um, try to follow all the principles correctly, um, you know, they can result, especially in isolated plating, on having a later catastrophic failure. So patient may get a partial union, may start feeling pretty good, start ambulating, and then six months, nine months down the road, you may have breakage, whether it be screws or the plate at the junction of the head and the shaft component of the plate, et cetera. Um, and this is barring even maybe making technical errors like putting a lock screw just above metaphyseal comminution, you know, trying to do appropriate transitional modules and everything else. There was some deficiency there. So really started to try to think with those patients that historically seem to be higher risk, uh, morbidly obese, smokers, a lot of metaphyseal comminution where even if you thought you did your best, you left a little distraction instead of compression or aligning things. Um, and any real situation for great instability, poor bone quality or based on fracture pattern, you started to think how do you enhance your techniques? Now the danger always is um, with such metadiaphyseal comminuted fractures, you can make a construct that's too stiff. And then this can lead to other problems um, as well, including obviously non-union and catastrophic failure. Um, and then finally, many of these patients that are elderly osteoporotic or their periprosthetic distal femur fractures, these people need to be mobilized immediately because they can be subject to similar complication as hip fractures. So protracted time and non-weight bearing and limiting their activity can have really a catastrophic means on their systemic system. Um, so with combining all of those different balls in the air, so to speak, we thought, how can we get these patients up? How can we get reliable fixation? And how can we make controlled instability? So you don't want to be overly stable. You don't want to be unstable. So you could call it controlled stability or controlled instability and dial it in to allow for immediate weight bearing in these groups and also avoid the issues. Even if you went on to healing, sometimes you would fade into varus and you would have other mechanical complications. Um, and so that really started the genesis of this. And then when thinking into this a little bit more, then you start thinking, well, the implants behaving separately versus together in the proximal and distal aspects, what are the benefits of that? And I think we all can uh, come to a consensus that stacking your distal fragment with as much fixed angle fixation as possible is really gonna help you with that stability of the distal fragment. And then the thing is about spreading out that stability or spreading out that rigidity in the proximal fragment. <clears throat> so this affords you the opportunity to stack the distal fragment even greater. Um, and then further stacking the distal fragment greater, the concept of unitization, meaning linking the implants also, um, you know, can be helpful. So with unitization, then it also comes one of twofold. If you get a single point of fixation through both implants, that could potentially be an axis of rotation in the flexion extension plane. So optimally, if you can get two points of fixation, that's also gonna help you. So that takes care of our distal fragment. In terms of our proximal fragment, then the same concept of using flexible fixation closest to the uh, area of the fracture site, the most distal part of the proximal fragment. So frequently a non-lock screw or unicortical lock screw can be used. And then you really wanna spread out your screws. Cause remember, this is kind of adding a belt to suspenders to keep your pants up. So it, the whole point isn't um, to make it super rigid, but to make it enhance stability. Um, and that's really the direction that we went in with that. And then you can afford yourself the opportunity, depending on the needs for the side plate, if you bring that side plate up proximally and um, 
get it near the vastus ridge, you could potentially shoot a couple screws through there because many of these elderly patients, by definition, are full risk. That's how they got that fracture. And you could prophylactically even put some screws through the plate to stabilize their proximal femur from a neck femoral head uh, in case they are subject to another fall. So that's kind of how this rolled out. Um, initially, when presenting the concept um, at meetings and um, you know throughout, some, some real concerns were raised um, and they were accurate concerns. And the main concern was what historically would say is confusing the bone, combining a plate technique with a nail technique. But in reality, <clears throat> we're going for secondary healing here. We're not really confusing the bone and these implants are all tools for going for primary or secondary healing. And so really all we're doing is doing a supplementary fixation. So that's kind of how um, the genesis of this started in concept and then translating to clinically. And then I think many of our colleagues are seeing the merits of this and really following similar techniques you know, throughout the country and even throughout the world. So I think this has been a, a, a benefit. You know, in your manuscript, you discussed primarily using this technique in osteoporotic patients. What are your current indications and have they evolved? I think the indications clearly are for extreme common use, especially in an osteoporotic patient. And an osteoporotic patient doesn't necessarily mean elderly. It could also mean, you know, um, somebody on chronic seizure meds or chronic smoker, or, or, you know, they could be a 40 years old young person but they can um, still have these problems. They can have systemic conditions like lupus or rheumatoid, but these are, these are all really higher risk situations. So that metadiaphyseal comminution in the high risk patient, especially if they're obese and um, really allows you to mobilize them sooner and I think safer. <clears throat> those, are, those are the main ones. Rich, anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I think age is not really a cutoff, just like you said, but if, if the, the medial aspect of the distal femur and that metaphysis, even in a young person, if that, if that zone of injury is extremely common, it is, I mean, we often see that with motorcycles, pedestrian stuff, struck, stuff like that, um, that, 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 that'll be also be an indication for me to use the uh, nail plate technique. Have you seen any failures of the nail plate technique in your practice or? So we really know. <laughs> no, and we're I'm I'm actually um finishing up. I wanted to get o to over a hundred. So now we have over a hundred patients in a multi center study. Um and our and our heal rate has been ninety eight percent, something like that. Uh there've been there's one delayed union uh in a repeat non union uh case, but other than that everyone's everyone's healed. Can you speak a little bit about the post opera protocol that you guys are currently employing for these nail plate combinations? Are they all range of motion is tolerated, weight bearing is tolerated? Yeah, we didn't start that way because as with <clears throat> anything new you're experimenting with, you may be a little apprehensive. Uh, you may lean back on some old uh, concepts when you only were using one thing or another as opposed to both. Over time, as we build confidence and sort of results, Pretty much the whole point of doing this is to allow people to be weight bearing is tolerated and mobilize them early and get all those benefits systemically as well. Have you seen sort of maybe an earlier healing rate with these, given the fact that they're weight bearing on them, or have you found that it's not changed? I know some of these distal femurs can take many, many months to heal, and some have even very late failures. So the late failures, again, is one of the things that we've avoided, and you know there's studies fluttering around 20% of failure, even with isolated distal femoral plating. So that, you know, as we discussed, we haven't seen. Um, and in terms of healing, our, the average time to unions we've been seeing is give or take around four months. And it's been very, very consistent. That is the one thing that I have noticed, this is anecdotal and another good thing to look at is the consistency of the fine union. And it almost is always between three and a half and four and a half months. Rich, have you seen the same? Yeah, and you know something that's interesting that you notice after looking at these X-rays for a while is that um, you know without before this, I feel like the posterior medial corner uh, of of the metaphysis is always kind of the last one to show some some fluffiness. And uh, with nail plate, what I've been noticing, especially on the lateral, is kind of 
more abundant callus um, that is posterior and then or towards that end cap seal comminution. Um, but it's something that we've been seeing consistently with, with the nail plates around that time. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, guys. Well, it's been a pleasure, and thank you for uh, inviting us to share uh, with your journal club. Thanks for having us. Thanks. So now we're going to, you know, address sort of the question and answer portion um, of our distal femur journal club series. I want to thank all the authors for hopping on and staying on with us. Uh, one of the uh, questions that was proposed by the audience is, can you sort of go over your preferred surgical approaches for both lateral and medial fixation? And if we could start off with Dr. Sanders and kind of go along the panel, that would be great. Uh, <clears throat> okay, can you hear me or see me? Yes, sir. <laughs> I like that. Um, okay, I don't think you can see me, but anyway, uh, I think that, uh, you know, standard uh, you, standard fixation uh, is uh, based really on the fracture pattern. Uh, obviously, if it's a stable pattern, you can go ahead and make a, a, a small lateral incision uh, and see the distal metaphyseal fracture, put, put a locking plate on, uh, and uh, really uh, then go ahead and percutaneously push the plate up, uh, use the jigs to put the screws in uh, the shaft. Uh, but uh, obviously, uh, the more common unit it is, uh, I think uh, I'm still trained uh, to do absolutely anatomic fixation of articular surfaces. So I would uh, uh, extend my incision distally and do more of a parapetella uh, extension. Then you go all the way down to the tibial tubercle and you can invert the, uh, uh, the uh, patella uh, and uh, uh, try to uh, get uh, the fracture uh, anatomically fixed. You can dislocate uh, the metaphyseal region, if it's highly comminuted, uh, and actually translate uh, the articular surface, you can see it. Uh, and then I actually like to do, uh, I guess, uh, <laughs> I'm an old guy now, so I like to do uh, a standard fixation, uh, reduce everything, make a K-wire jail, replace them with individual screws, uh, and then when I have a stable fixation, put that back and uh, put my uh, locking plate on. Uh, and then uh, obviously, uh, if I uh, need a, a medial plate, uh, I think that um, that was discussed uh, quite well uh, by Dr. Nork uh, and even Dr. Swinkowski. Uh, we would use much smaller implants now and use them just to stabilize. But uh, honestly, uh, for most of these fractures, uh, Dr. Mast and Dr. Gantz uh, taught us that uh, if you uh, uh, keep the soft tissue envelope and you have a stable fixation and you can do this uh, with indirect reduction, the medial side, unless it's completely uh, destroyed through a, a you know, grade a three type open a fracture, uh, you probably can get healing on the medial side. Uh, and that would be my preferred method. If, uh, if it was completely unstable, I would do what uh, uh, Frank does, uh, which I like to believe we kind of uh, pioneered. I have a partner named uh, uh, Tony Infante, who uh, for a long time had been doing nail plate uh, constructs. And I think that Frank picked that up uh, and saw the advantage of that. And uh, when we have a really unstable fracture and we want to get somebody walking right away, we'll use a nail plate construct without a, without a second thought. Hope that answers the question. Is anyone on the panel using, when they're doing dual plate fixation, a sort of percutaneous incision? I know that's sort of been talked about in JOT. Um, is anyone sort of utilizing that? What's their experience been with that? I, I think you need to see what you're doing. <laughs> you know, I don't, on the, are you talking about on the medial side, if I'm gonna do a medial supplementary plate, Right. Yeah, look, I believe the anatomical uh, studies, you know, Therachai, uh, you know, map that out and you can, you can safely put screws anywhere on the equator on the medial side of the leg in the distal two thirds of the thigh safely relative to the, to the femoral, uh, the femoral artery because Hunter's Canal is such a posterior structure and the vessel tends to hang posteriorly. So all that being said, I believe it's safe, but I never do it. Uh, just because a, a medial subastus 
is uh, such a rely reliable anatomical approach. And if I can do that uh, safely, it just gives me comfort. And because even getting back to Mark's point, and I think what Roy said too, um, it's not like you need overpowering medial sided fixations. So that part's not the, not the most challenging. Um, and so I think we're not seeing the stiffness that I know that was Roy's paper from 30 years ago. And I'm sure he, you know, he probably has similar experience. We just don't see the same stiffness problems. Uh, maybe we're just doing our dissections a little bit uh, differently, a little more carefully um, now. Um, so that hasn't, that hasn't been a problem. So I do them open. So that was an, Excellent answer to a question didn't you, that you didn't ask about our experience with percutaneous fixation medially. Yeah, Frank Liberace told me one day, um, when you're driving on, on the highway, if you see a pothole, you're not going to close your eyes and hope you don't hit it. So, you know, percutaneous for me is, is one of those things where I, I want to see where the badness is and, and, and get to where I'm at and uh, make sure we fix it right. On a, on a different but related topic, just when you're talking about the approaches, on the cases where you're reasonably sure you're not going to do a medial approach, um, I've gravitated to doing these in the lateral position, and that's helped quite a bit. One of the biggest concerns with, with these, if, if they're comminuted, is uh, valgus. Uh, you know, we, we're all taught thou shalt not bear us, but valgus deformity is by far the most common. And if, when you do these in the lateral position, you can use gravity to help you. You put a bump uh, at the fracture site and you can sort of titrate the amount of varus that the gravity is uh, giving you. And you just put the lateral plate on and you know, uh, ergonomically, anytime you can operate looking down and, and with your specimen, your fracture, uh, your bone being parallel to the floor, it's just much more comfortable. And uh, I did this a little bit out of uh, necessity when operating on, you know, medium patients with BMIs in the 40 to 50 range. <laughs> Bill, Bill, are you talking about extra articular distal femoral fractures and periprosthetics, or you do your supracondyl or intercondylars in the lateral position as well? If it's I'm a simple, yeah. laterally. Yeah, if it's a so, simple intercondylar, I'll, I'll do it laterally as well. Uh, you know, you have to externally rotate the distal fragment and, and do the articular surface first and, you know, just rotate through the fracture a little bit. If it's a more comminuted and you know, more complex uh, intraarticular split or comminution, then I'll do it supine for sure. And then also to um, <clears throat> address the nail plate situation, there are two very different things if somebody has a native knee versus a uh, previously existed arthroplasty knee. And so the considerations are as follows. With a native knee, you can uh, have independent incisions, um, a small incision if it's an A-type fracture, a bigger incision, you know, that allows you a lateral parapetellar if it's a higher grade intraarticular fracture uh, in terms of the plate. And then you could use your standard two, three finger breadth incision for your retrograde nail. Now, people talk about doing a plate first, a nail first, or what have you. I personally will do the nail first, um, and I'll do the nail first, and almost everybody, a 10 millimeter nail is fine. And if you look at Bobby Brumbach's work, when he said you need 12 millimeter nails, it was to get a five millimeter locking bolt back at that time when it made a difference with the machining through the nail and nail failures. Um, we have some data that has shown uh, that's out there. As long as you get a five millimeter bolt, you know, obviously just um, uh, supplementing what uh, Brumbach said, um, you're fine. So a 10 millimeter nail is fine. So you put a nail up, you put a either intermedial, posterolateral, lateral, or medial lateral screw in it, and it's still a bit flexible. And so then you could use a plate for the final reduction. Um, with non-lock screws to pull things all around, do your unitization, and then it becomes a quote-unquote drill and fill operation and you dial in what stability you want. When you have a periprosthetic fracture, what's very important is we all get lulled into this desire to do small incisions. Um, you don't wanna affect your tibial polyethylene in a bad way. You don't wanna hurt your patella button in a bad way if they did a patella resurfacing. So I'll reopen their anterior incision uh, 
do a lateral power patellar. And through that same incision, you could distally apply your plate and obviously distally apply your nail. And you put a bump under the distal femur and allows your tibia to sublux posteriorly a bit. And it makes an easy access. Now, there's a couple of other considerations with this as well. When you have a total knee in place, your starting point, you put it as anterior as possible based on the trochlea, but you're limited. And funny enough, we talk about CR knees, there's no issue with a box, blah, 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 but CR knees have the trochlea go more posteriorly. So this is gonna enhance the other deformity. So I know Dr. Ritchie mentioned valgus, we all know that one. The other one is apex posterior extension. And so based on many current nail offerings, they're relatively straight. They have a minimal bend somewhere around five degrees. And if you start posteriorly, you're gonna end up with apex posterior. Now there's some newer modern nails that allow different distal angulations. And so a higher grade angulation with a more posterior starting point or a shorter stature patient with a tighter distal curve you can avoid this problem. And then the other thing is, do you always need to combine a big plate with a nail? And I think we discussed uh, the merits of stacking distal fixation. And so there's some options out there where you can unitize and stack distal fixation at the same time, but may not have to put a big implant more proximally. So, you know, as with everything, over time, things transcend and you know, we learn a little more what we can do. Uh, but those are just some comments I wanted to add. We have another question from the audience, which is for elderly patients that cannot comply with restrictions, such as those with dementia, is the panel's preference hybrid fixation, single lateral plating, nailing, or the other? Yes. Hello, splints. There you go. <laughs> If you can't comply and you're not that demented for a pillow splint, then <laughs> the answer is to do something where they can weight bear immediately so they don't die like a hip fracture. Um, and whatever your flavor is, I think, you know, each of our personal biases from um, our discussion time together, but the common goal is immediate weight bearing and mobilization. And in, especially in the elderly, they're there, there are and there will be studies coming out showing that even in intra fractures, you can still reliably weight bear them. And, uh, and that's the most important factor is getting them mobilized. And for me, I think it's really fracture pattern dependent. You know, I think we're appropriately, you, know, you can estimate, you know, femoral non-unions or clinically significant delayed unions that really affect patients. You can you can round up to 20, you could say 15, but I, you know, I think it's more in the 10 to 15% range. And so I think what we're doing is trying to identify those patients and then doing more on that subpopulation of patients. So I just, I, I just hope people that are, you know, all the, all the participants aren't, aren't taken away that distal femur fractures equal, you know, bicolumnar plating fixation or nail plate combos that I think it's a question of identifying the, the minority of patients that are either going to be young that need extra fixation on the medial side or elderly patients that, that need, need something additionally for early mobilization. But there's still a pretty significant number of elderly patients with distal femoral fractures that you can weight bear even after just lateral plating alone. Mm. I don't know about that. I worry about that. I, I worry I about everything, Roy. <laughs> that's why I take Xanax. Yeah. Well, that's why I use nails. <laughs> I, I would try to put a nail in anything I could, uh, but uh, obviously, um, I don't know. We, we uh, In Florida, we have really elderly patients that are really decrepit, and uh, home health care nurses get them up and walk them around, and everything breaks and falls apart, uh, even with the best uh, fixation. Uh, so uh, it doesn't seem to happen so much with a nail. Maybe they'll shift a little. You don't put blocking screws in in the metaphyseal region. But um, just, uh, you know, my, my feeling is I don't ever want to see these patients back again. You know, you do one operation and one and done. Uh, and so uh, that's why we tend, uh, when we don't feel comfortable, uh, either the fracture is too low or we think the fixation is too uh, 
um, uh, to mobile, even with a nail, uh, will add a plate. But if uh, I agree with you, if uh, it's a simple fracture and you can put a, uh, a plate in, and certainly if they have a distal, uh, if they have a, uh, a total knee, then, uh, you know, and the box is closed and all of this, then you're going to have to use a lock plate uh, and kind of deal with it. But uh, they, in, they, in they fail. All, in all fairness, closed box knees and closed box knees that don't have a poly plug you could pull out and put a nail in. Um, yes, they exist. Most of them are historical. Most of those knees died or the patients died. So even with PS knees, uh, just so we all understand, the appropriate diameter nail, if you use a small enough nail, you're 99% of the time going to be fine. Another concept to understand is the femur is basically a block of cement or a sidewalk on its side. And so you have compression medially and tension exposure laterally and a neutral axis that goes up the shaft. And what every old guy that laid cement did was throw fencing into the hole where he dropped cement and that dropped the neutral axis. So that made compression in that block of cement, the dominant force and a nominal amount of tension side. That's what you're doing with a nail. You're bringing that neutral axis laterally. And in those situations that we're all talking about, those unique situations or not so unique anymore where we're concerned, now you did that and then you brought a plate on that nominal amount of tension side and then you add unitization. Now you, you caused yourself a great situation where you can walk that patient immediately. Right. So, it, you know, there's biology, there's mechanics, and that's why there's biomechanics. And really, it kind of makes sense in the right situation. It's not every situation, but in the right situation. So I, I have to learn how to, how to apply cement now. Like I have to learn about sidewalks. It's fantastic. Where did you learn that? No problem. That, that's why that's my dad's side business. You see, maybe I can teach you something. Finally. Yeah, you're going to have to. I'm going to have to take lessons. Awesome. Cement. Well, as reimbursement goes down, I'm going back to sidewalks. That's right. Rebar, baby. Rebar. Uh, there was so, a yeah, question from, for the group. Uh, one thing we didn't really touch on, and curious if anyone is a believer or doing it, is the, the whole concept of dynamic lock plating. Anybody? The science is, uh, is reasonable, but doesn't seem like it's caught on. Just curious if anyone's doing it. You're talking about active locking? Yeah, whatever you want to call it, dynamic lock plating, active lock plating, active plating. Well, the one failed lateral plate I had was there was a funny little screw called a DLS screw, and, <laughs> and um, that failed. Failed miserable. So, and then some of these dynamic locking screws, and we can all argue, and you know, there was one paper that said just over drilling the lateral cortex to apply a lock screw and just get fixation on the medial cortex may or may not simulate the concept of a dynamic lock screw. I think the jury's a little bit out and you're right, Bill. Um, it hasn't caught on enough to get any real drive with data, at least in my opinion. But don't, don't you think that, uh, you know, and you pioneered this, Bill, right? Long plates, few screws, and you put the screws in based on uh, distance and uh, maintaining flexibility so you don't make the construct too rigid. I think that's more important than anything else. You know, if you put a screw in every hole, which the reps love, but is bad for the patient, uh, you're going to have a problem because the implant will be too rigid. But um, if you uh, are careful about where you put the screws, uh, especially in the shaft, you don't need a screw, you know, maybe one in every four holes or something. Uh, that's going to give you enough flexibility, whether it's titanium alloy or stainless, uh, that you don't really need uh, this uh, um, uh, uh, dynamic locking from my, my point of view. Right. Yeah, I guess, um, you know, the, the theoretically, the, the, these contracts are relatively stiff on the lateral side. All these plates are pretty big, thick, bulky, stainless or titanium. And on the lateral side, un, right underneath the plate, it's relatively stiff. There's very little strain, no matter how many screws you do or don't put in the shaft. And because the, the femur is so wide, the medial side sees a little bit more or modestly more amount of strain and, and micro motion. And so I look at it as, 
you know, are there ways to equalize that strain? And one way to equalize the strain is to put a, a nail plate combo. You're, you're making that a little more symmetric. Another way is to put a medial plate. It equalizes the strain. And a third way is to do the dynamic clock plating. I, I look at that as a way to equalize strain more than anything else. Mm -hmm. So I, I think there's sort of, in my book, there's multiple ways to get there. And it's this, you know, for the participants, this doesn't apply to the simple fracture that you, you know, anatomically reduce, compress, lag. This is uh, you know, a discussion for the palmonutic fractures. Yeah, but I think, Bill, I, I mean, I, I agree with you. I mean, I think the, um, the mechanical theory behind that all makes sense, right? And the dynamic locking screws were an epic fail. Um, the far cortical locking screws, I think, still exist. And then Mike had you know, looked at the mechanics of just, like you said, over drilling the proximal cortex to effectively create a far cortical locking screw to get more symmetry of motion. But I think it only would be reliably reproduced in a very simple, relatively transverse fracture pattern where you would actually uh, see that, that load reliably convert into increased motion laterally. I think that's why people haven't embraced it because no one Please raise your hand now. I don't think anyone on here has has really embraced it, but theoretically, I think it makes it makes some sense, right? Um, but I'm just not convinced in comminuted fractures that that's what's going to what that's what's going to drive union. I think it does in a transverse sheep osteotomy model, but I don't think it translates to translates to the typical comminuted metaphyseal fracture patterns that we see. I think. Yeah, I know the guy that did, you know, did the overdrilling. He's uh, married to my wife, and uh, still don't still don't do it very much. You did that with Mike, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I, I have a question uh, for the panel uh, because I'm old school and I was uh, trained with blade plate and use lag screws a lot. But when uh, we use uh, these lock plates, these long plates. Um, uh, sometimes I like to put a, um, uh, a screw in the metaphyseal area as a lag through the plate to the medial uh, cortex uh, to try to pull it in. Uh, and uh, a lot of people don't use that. They just use the plate as a bridge and they let that medial cortex uh, hang out. Uh, and um, uh, we have a, a tremendous uh, a discussion about that. Every time I do that, I get yelled at by my uh, junior partners because they tell me I don't know what I'm doing and I'm old school and I'm just kind of curious what whether I'm really uh, that ancient or there is no benefit to it or it's a good idea or it's actually a bad idea so that I know what to do in the future so I open it up let me ask you one question are they really recognizing that you're uh, as in everything in life you're allowed to have more than one problem so you can treat one part of an injury in one way and another part of an injury in the other way. And if you're linking a very large fragment and using that principle for primary bone healing and lagging it in, and then you have your metaphyseal comminution below it, and you're treating that for secondary bone healing, how is that any different when we're treating primary bone healing for the articular segment? It's the same thing upside down. So it, that makes a lot of sense in my mind. Okay, so that's a yes. But Roy, you're referring to the, the fracture pattern where you've got that kind of large medial wedge fragment that's kind of hanging out in left field. Right. Yeah, no, I, no, I agree. I think, you know, Frank's right. But I think, I don't think you're violating a principle by getting it back in the ball game, right? If you're putting a single screw into it and pulling it over, it's still going to allow kind of secondary bone healing. There's still going to be flexibility through it. If you rain three screws into it and then compress a malreduction, I think that's that's an error. But putting a screw into it just to bring that thing over, yeah, mm -hmm. we do that frequently. So, so I would be a yes. Good. Okay. Yeah. But sometimes I, I might put two screws in if it's very long. But okay. Yeah, reducing the gap can always help. And Roy, you you taught a lot of us on the call. You know, principles are important. Just like Frank said, even if it's upside down. If it, if, it, if it works and helps, helps the bone kind of get into that biologic environment, then, then that's what matters. Okay.
You guys need to come to my Monday conference and support me. Yeah. No, I got to come to your Monday conference and hear people tell you you don't know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> well, they've been telling me that forever, right? <laughs> Times have changed. I don't remember that. <laughs> I don't remember that either. <laughs> okay. Well, as it's getting late on the East Coast, I want to respect everybody's time. And I think this discussion has been great. And I'm sure we could uh, go on for a long time. But I wanted, if it's okay, is there um, any final comments or thoughts that the panel wanted to offer on, I guess, when you're in conference with your trainees, is there a main takeaway point or something you always bring up in the conference about these distal femur fractures that you want the, pan the attendees to know or hear from you? I'll, I still I'll make one quick comment. Just, you know, every one of these fractures uh, decide if you want to induce primary or secondary bone healing. You sort of alluded to that. Simple fractures, anatomic reduction, primary bone healing, stiff construct. And if you're going to have a comminuted one, don't do the schizophrenic fixation. I think, you know, what Roy is talking about is perfectly, I agree 100% with what was said. Uh, bridge it, you know, leave some uh, you know four to six holes open over the fracture but uh, think about for every fracture you plate whether it's a distal femur or anywhere else in the body uh, try to induce one or the other primary or secondary bone healing and, and build your construct accordingly my take my take would be just uh, don't be afraid to get an intraoperative plane film radiograph to to measure your angles and make sure you've got the alignment no matter how many distal femurs you've done people still still get their alignment off and you've got a pretty easy method to do it and then you're confident for the rest of the confident for the rest of the case yeah for me just to echo everyone is just like dr richie and dr sanders and dr Labracci and nork said balance fixation you don't need to fill every hole don't make your reps happy um, make sure that you're addressing your uh, neutral axis and remember in the elderly you want to get everyone up and walking as soon as possible Yeah, I just would uh, say that, uh, you know, when you have an interarticular fracture, you got to fix that first and take that articular block that's anatomically reduced that you can only do through uh, open direct vision uh, and then attach that to the shaft. Uh, and uh, that's that's what the plate's for. But you, if you don't uh, reduce the fracture anatomically, uh, they're going to have a bad outcome. Uh, and so uh, it's both of those techniques that are important, not just putting a plate on and running screws in and getting the alignment. When you have an articular component, you have to, especially with coronal uh, fractures, you have to get them anatomic or they're going to end up having a really bad problem. That's it. I was going to make one other comment. Um, sometimes there's a mismatch between the patient's anatomy and your uh, pre-contoured plate. And so uh, I try to line up the shaft with the middle of the condyle for these comminuted ones. And sometimes there's a space between plate and bone and you just hold it there with a lock screw rather than sucking it over with a non-lock screw and creating a, you know, the proverbial hockey stick deformity. So a little trick. Hockey stick, the lightning are up two nothing. Second you can see period. see in the background there. Yeah, man. All right, guys, thank you very much. Have a good night. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Just to wrap it up from our uh, end, there'll be an evaluation that you should be seeing now uh, as attendees. Please complete that. There'll also be a recording of this session that'll be available on the AO North America YouTube channel. Uh, it takes about 24 hours, but you can please look for that to rewatch. And lastly, the take home messages uh, to make sure you look for these coronal plane fractures where they're present almost 40% and recommend, strongly recommend the use of CT imaging, uh, especially with open distal femur fractures. Look to use a longer plate length, especially in the, for lateral locked plating of distal femur fractures, as Dr. Ritchie uh, discussed. Counsel patients on the potential need for reoperation for these. Uh, almost one in five, or you know, as Dr. Dort alluded to, 10 to 15 percent, where we talked about this subset of patients that have difficulty with their fracture morphology, and then consider the use of the alternative fixation constructs in these patients with the difficult fracture morphology. And just as a plug for the upcoming sessions, Tuesday, June 15th, uh, the topic will be distal humerus fractures.
Thank you so much, everyone.